Welcome everyone to the second session on the aesthetics of exemplarity. And today we have two papers and a discussant. So I think we have enough time for uh, uh, a discussion on each of the paper after the presentations and then the discussant and a general discussion. Uh, the first paper today is Ina Kuhn and Gillian Genner, who will, pres will present their paper on performing utopian apocalyptic futures, utopian festivals, and, and preparedness drills as laboratories for drag transgressive futures and they're both from from Freiburg University and for me the the German university system is as mysterious as the Swedish midsummer celebration so I can't really figure out more than you're in the department for anthropology and European ethnology both of you and I think you will share your screen and the video of the presentation, Julian, is that right? So go ahead. Oh. Yes, yeah, so uh, thank you very much for the introduction. So in 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 um, in the German speaking landscape, we have this distinction between Volkskunde, folklore studies, and Völkerkunde um, ethnology, or so what used to be ethnology. So there's this split, and we are with um, the folklore Volkskunde. Um, institute in in Freiburg. So we have a um, comparative ethnographic research project. I I am a postdoc. Um, Ina Kuhn is a PhD student. We work uh, very closely together. Markus Tauschek um, is also part of our, our of our group, but he couldn't make it today. So to be here, um, Ina, is there anything you want to add before we start? Nope. Later. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Fair enough. Um, then I will try to share my screen. Um, yeah, so we decided just to pre-record our presentation because we we are two peer persons. Internet just broke down two days ago and so on and so on. So it just seemed the safe way to go. Um, so. While always remaining unknown and uncertain, visions of the future guide our actions in the present. Paradoxically, envisioning apocalyptic and utopian futures can bring about a sense of purpose and certainty in times of crisis. In our joint research project, we analyze utopian festivals and survivalist preparedness drills as future laboratories, as experimental spaces which allow actors to envision and perform utopian or apocalyptic futures. Both laboratories provide actors with a taste of what the future could be like and, more importantly, what they could or should be like. Therefore, future laboratories allow actors to enact exemplary versions of themselves while evoking a sense of being ahead of one's time. By a two ethnographic anecdotes from our respective fields, we portray how future laboratories put transgressive futures to the test. One, by overriding present rules, the others, the other by establishing the rules. Recipes to survive. Preparedness drills explore surviving in a catastrophic future without functioning infrastructures and institutions. As Mitchell rightly states, what if questions serve as a starting point for imagining worst case scenarios. The most popular worst case scenario among my informants is a major blackout. My gatekeeper, Fred, went great lengths to draw a drastic and vivid picture of such a situation in conversation with a skeptic outsider. He talked about the effects of non-working traffic lights and about people getting stuck in elevators. Switching on the ceiling light, keeping the fridge working, flushing the toilet, impossible during a blackout, he explained. Adding another edge to his already dramatic vision, he said, imagine the city of Berlin without working toilets. What may be a disaster for others is but a challenge to Fred. He likes to brag about his food supplies for one year and his private diesel filling station. 
His pride and joy is his tailor-made off-roader, which enables him to travel for three months without refueling or getting supplies. Whatever may happen, whatever may happen, I am prepared, he likes to say. But there is something inherently transgressive in the ways preppers like Fred develop and prepare for such scenarios. First, the worst case scenarios question the idea of a continuing between present and future. Leading a normal life is linked to the idea of having a future, of knowing what to expect and expecting to know what to expect in the future. Prepper's obsession with worst case scenarios troubles the very idea of what it means to have a future. Secondly, imagining worst case scenarios highlights the fragility and vulnerability of everyday life. It also raises a problematic moral question. Who deserves to live? Who deserves to survive? Those who are prepared, would Fred and fellow preppers answer. In their scenarios, the unprepared appear as potential looters and marauders. To envision, a crisis means to think of others as enemies and not of fellow citizens or even humans whose rights and needs have to be respected. Prepping is not about killing people, but about self-defense, Fred says. But isn't the latter expression but a euphemism for the first? In prepper scenarios, the crisis culminates in a civil war-like situation in which rules of present everyday life no longer apply. Authorities lose control and the public order collapses. My informants face the potential unraveling of life as we know it with systematic planning. Their preparing measures aim to compensate potential shortages of any good and service normally provided by institutions and infrastructures. With an eye to future scarcity, preppers accumulate an abundance of supplies and capabilities in the present. But where to start? Checklists, YouTube tutorials, guidelines, handbooks, and so on help beginner preppers to identify and mitigate their potential vulnerabilities. Those recipes for survival often come with a technical, military-infused language. Preppers think of a crisis as a situation in the military sense of the term, and the situation requires tactics, strategies, capabilities, skills, and so on. Being prepared, then, is not limited to stockpiling according to guidelines or rules. It is about embodying physical and mental cap capabilities as well how to use a knife, how to camouflage oneself, how to bandage a wound, how to build a shelter out of nat natural materials, or how to remain calm under stress. Getting prepared then involves training. There are commercial preparedness courses, usually provided by former soldiers. And it is the soldier whose ability and will to survive in a hostile environment serves as an exemplar among preppers. These preparedness drills not only teach capabilities, but offer a taste of a different future. To give an example, one course taught basic survival skills. However, there was no food for two and a half days. Some of my informants put their preparation to test by burning, by burn, <laughs> turning off electricity, water and heating in their family homes for a couple of days. Enacting survival scenarios in this way should convey a sense of what it feels like to survive and a sense of being able to survive. Preparedness drills allow informants to experience themselves as exceptional people capable of coping with exceptional situations. Now towards a more positive outlook to the future or formula for a good life. In the last decade, future or more precisely utopia-themed events have been emerging on the pop culture landscape of Germany. Small-scale rural festivals such as We lost the sound suddenly. The heterogeneous festivals organized by um oh, sorry, I unmuted myself on un accidentally. I'm really sorry, Ina. ...themselves as exceptional people capable of coping with exceptional situations. Okay. Now towards a more positive outlook to the future, or formula for a good life. 
In the last decade, future or more precisely utopia-themed events have been emerging on the pop cultural landscape of Germany. Small-scale rural festivals such as Days of Utopia, Move Utopia, Utopia or Utopival aim to not only negotiate alternative futures and communities, but to put them into practice. The heterogeneous festivals organized by eco-villages, church organizations or activists see themselves as spaces of opportunity to explore and train new ways of living. Each festival proposes a certain frame, a kind of formula for a good life, as the German cultural anthropologists Monique Scheer and Jan Henriksen put it. These different formulas are nothing short of a, to some extent, negotiable, but always proposed set of different rules. Let me portray this by empirical examples gathered during my two stays at the Utopia. The festival was first organized in 2015 by a loose group of activists who formed a network named Living Utopia. The group formulated a set of motives, ecological, vegan, solidary, drug-free, and no exchange logic. During their since annual gathering, the more or less 150 participants are meant to live by this set of list of adjectives as a motto in order to acquire and practice these rules, or in emic wording, new certainties. Here, ecological is translated into an ideally waste-free community life with self-made composting toilets and plastic-free foods. These foods are not only vegan, but also rescued foods, which are solely provided through dumpster diving or food sharing. Solidary can mean that those who have some money at their hands and currently don't use it, as the participants learn to phrase it, may give that money into an exchange logic free money pot that is part of every festival. The pot is openly accessible at any given time and participants can take out any amount with no questions asked and more importantly, no consideration. Lastly, drug-free usually includes alcohol and nicotine, and sometimes even caffeine or sugar. There's also a handbook for utopians that explains these rules in further detail. During the festival days, this handbook is often referred to or even read from. For instance, when it is unclear in a social interaction, whether an exchange of things, but also a conversation or physical interaction, is based on capitalistic exchange logic again. The participants, mostly from the educated, creative middle class, intend to follow the moral exemplarity of the festival rules and their role models. Some participants proclaim themselves as pioneers of change. Others are attributed to be one of those leading roles by festival novices. The distinction between who is new and learning and who is leading by example is, among other aspects, made through language and experience. For instance, one initial visitor admitted that she didn't understand, quote, certain codes, unquote, such as festival-specific neologisms for gender-inclusive or body or sex-positive language. In terms of experience, those participants who already strictly live by one or more of the festival's rules on a daily basis, for example, with significantly less or no money, are looked up to as a practical as well as moral example. In the follow-up interviews, participants often explain to me which rule they were so far able to integrate in their everyday lives and in which areas they, quote, had not yet progressed as far, unquote. This common formulation hints at the, at times, spiritually charged idea that one can progress to a more authentic version of oneself, which needs to be and can be uncovered in the safe space of the festival. For example, during a so-called rebirthing or self-love workshop at the last Utopia, the participants were supposed to reconnect with themselves in terms of rediscovering their essential needs. The idea behind this, these workshops is that change starts within oneself and that a truer self would more instinctively adapt to the more natural and therefore humane rules of living, like the previously mentioned motives. The ultimate goal is not only to practice, but to internalize these new certainties, such as sharing money without consideration, to turn them into new intuitions and to maintain them in the outside world. One interviewee metaphorically described the festival as to be acupuncture needles poking society and then radiating, meaning exemplifying the new way of living. 
So for the participants, the festival with its specific formula for a good life serves as practical and moral orientation beyond the festival days. And the personal experience as well as, well as the confrontation with model participants serve as a precedent that a differently ruled future as experienced at the Utopia and as seen in others is actually possible. Reforming apocalyptic utopian futures, exploring, tasting, becoming. Our fields may appear rather contradictory at first glance. However, we would like to point out three family resemblances. Firstly, both our fields provide actors with a space to explore futures which are radically different from the present. Preppers and utopians develop elaborate visions of what the future could or should be like. Drawing on Upper Durai's work, imagination has to be considered a collective and social practice. Both utopian and apocalyptic futures lack any of the institutional structures which shape present everyday life. Instead, these future visions bear promises of self-empowerment and self-efficiency. They allow actors to see themselves in charge of creating a future and ultimately making history. Tasters of the future. Secondly, our informants consider themselves to be pioneers who are ahead of their time. Moving beyond imagination, utopian festivals and preparedness drills make these futures tangible and serve as tasters of the future. Enacting future scenarios requires the suspension of current rules. Now, future laboratories provide a setting and a frame in the present to experience what the future could be and feel like. While the temporal and spatial setting is secondary, the frame is basically an offer of varying set of rules, or as we previously suggested, formulas or recipes for certain future scenarios. And last but not least, best practice examples for how to actually live by those rules. Becoming the future. Thirdly, getting a feeling of what the future could be like involves exploring alternative of better or exemplary versions of oneself. In both fields, it is not about pretending to be someone else, not about dressing up a role play, but rather serious play. As casual anthropologist Gary Blustian puts it, quote, a way of simultaneously investigating, constituting, and representing what kind of self is deemed appropriate, what kind is possible, and by implication, what kind is totally unthinkable, unquote. The joint exploration of future selves is also referred to as finding and realizing one's potential. As Brian the Knight phrased it, quote, potential, potentiality gives us the future's capacity to become future, unquote. Exploring future selves opens the possibility to become the self. Being one's own role model can be a catalyst for self-transformation, which also means getting closer to actual leading an exemplary, exemplary life. Thank you for listening. <laughs> Thank you so much, both of you. Uh, I think we'll do the same today as yesterday. We used the raise hand function, or you simply uh, write the question or ask for, um, <clears throat> for giving a question in uh, in the chat, but I prefer the raise and function. And thank you so much, both of you. I, I really enjoyed it. And I have lots of questions. Uh, but I think I'll start with two. <laughs> uh, I think it's important that you, you, you uh, compare this to seemingly different uh, notions or imaginaries of the future and that they're maybe not that different. Uh, and for me, the utopian imaginary is kind of an end of history. Uh, 
it's where history is, is aiming, while uh, the apocalyptic imaginary is not the end, it's a start of something new. Uh, and in that regard, both of these imaginaries implies a certain kind of, of uh, uh, societal purification. Um, have you any thoughts about that? Uh, and connected to that, I also would like to hear something about a third, very, very common imaginary about sustainability, sustainable futures or sustainable societies, their relationship between uh, the utopian festivals and imaginaries that you, you uh, talk about, Ina, and, and sustainability. Yeah, thank you. Um, concerning your idea that utopia, philosophically speaking, is kind of the end of history, that's something they try to reframe at the festival, saying that it's more of a progress. They have this common picture, they always turn to pictures to orientate, um, that you take two steps to, towards their imagination of a better world, of a better word, and then one step back. So um, the idea, the image, the collective imagination of utopia is, serves as an orientation, something that, yeah, combines them, that um, bonds them, that um, serves as a, um, yeah, the community, the community feeling. And also it's kind of a way to maybe you, you could say instrumentalizing the idea of utopia because as long as it's a progress you can always have people join so this way it's more of a movement right so it depends on whether it's one of those christian festivals or activist uh, frame festivals or eco village um, offered festivals whether it's this kind of progress or the ultimate goal but it's mostly um, described as a as something that's still um, yeah, formable by everyone who wants to join. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Maybe just just real quick. Um, I don't think that the like the crisis or the collapse is is the start of some, something new for 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 um, for my informants. At least I do not think beyond that. It's just like. Um, what will happen in the in the long run? In the long run, it's it's of no consideration. Uh, it's something they do not consider because it's what I think interests my informants is this moment of everything breaks away and you have to make it and provide it um, yourself. So that's the that's what catches the attention of of my informants. But how to educate your your kid? How to in the long run? So that's something they do not consider. Or also like um, scenarios like a long winding economic decay for, for years, uh, which, which takes over years. It's something they do not consider because it's not attractive. It's, it has to be something, suddenly every, anything break, everything breaks away, then you have to provide it yourself. And it's that moment uh, in which my informants take an interest in and they do not really think beyond. That's uh, my impression. Thank you. Uh, Ante? Oh, thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, it seems to me that, uh, that both of these groups, they're about like envisioning a future, but they're also quite much about like fashioning a, a, an ideal person who or ideal human, do you think? And I, did, <clears throat> I was wondering if you would like to say a word about that do you see that ideal person who does somehow also restrictive in a sense or how how could we criticize that that or should we just a thought and uh, yeah about this self fashioning of 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 uh, an ideal human
So I was thinking of these restrictions of not drinking alcohol and being vegan. That's one way of fashioning a, an ideal person. And uh, in the other case, it's about learning learning how to be self efficient by using various tools and by surviving in the in the wild and. Um, yeah, finally, I've just read a text by the German cultural anthropologist Andreas Reckwitz, who talks about singularities. And there he describes how people nowadays tend to find um, new versions of themselves to be exceptional and to have peak experiences, to have new first times and so on. And I feel like this might be an explanation for why there's such a strive for a a uh, kind of pure version of oneself that that that's a fair uh, analysis an ideal person in my field usually means an authentic version of yourself and therefore free from drugs and they would say unhealthy influences and habits which sounds pretty yeah biblical and puritan um but they do try to distance themselves from that Mm, I think it's more the idea that a different version of yourself can have different experiences and that it's about being 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 special and having these special um yeah new experience that are only possible with the new self. Yeah, that's where I'm thinking these days, but it's a very important point I'm I'm still on. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. For your comment. Uh, are there any more questions to Julian and Ina? Doesn't seem to be. I, then I have one last question uh, related to what you just said. You know, and that is, I mean, it's so easy to kind of em embed these um, notions of the future in established um, in narrative motives in, uh, in Christianity, in biblical terms and so on. And there's also, I think, a very interesting, relas interesting relationship between notions of progress and, and utopian development and, and tradition. Uh, does tradition, notions of tradition, traditional societies, traditional agriculture, traditional ways of living, are, are there such notions present in, 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 in your empirical material? You mean traditional notions? Notions of tradition, I mean, ideas about uh, traditional societies or, or traditional traditional agriculture. Uh, I mean, I have a colleague who, who has, she's been working on uh, what she calls everyday life climate activism. And it's so much about tradition, about small-scale societies, mm -hmm. how to grow your own, own food in different ways and so on, in seemingly tradition, traditional ways. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah for sure. Um, the ideas seem to be returning. If you compare to the Lebensreformbewegung, the life reform movement, I guess, or the, yeah, the 60s movements, um, the ideas, the ideas seem to be reoccurring, but they're trying to find, kind of find a new language for it and new ways to, um, create everyday practices to translate them into this everyday life of 2021. But yeah, definitely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I haven't done so much historical comparisons so far, but that might be useful. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, not that it's actually is traditional, but they have the idea of, of tradition. There's a notion of tradition, maybe yeah. in the way they're mm -hmm. famous. Mm -hmm. 
um, I, I think in, in both our fields, the idea of um, that we have estranged from from a, from a natural traditional way of living is 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 very dominant. I think in in both our fields. So my my informants also say, you know, my grandparents used to this, or my grand grandparents used to this, and we have to get back to the old way. So the the good the good life in the future is very much the good life which is past or which is imagined the, the good old times. So that's um it, it keeps reoccurring this, this idea of a primitive natural uh life and the idea of returning to a simpler and therefore more authentic whatever that may be way of of living i think it's something we um we we we, we stumble across in in our fields quite a lot and also the rejection of urban of urban life and of institutions so there's also an idea of an immediate connection to to life to nature to so maybe similar like uh, the wilhelm hof method we had yesterday so getting the, this immediate connection with one's body one's health and so on and so on thank you so much for a very interesting paper. Uh, I think it seems to be no more questions. So I think we move on to Anne Eriksen. And the last presentation. Anne is a professor of cultural history at the University of Oslo and a professor of cultural studies at the University of Bergen. So she's my colleague. And Anne is giving a paper called Exemplary Indecency. Go ahead, Anna. Thank you. Uh, I'll just share screen with you. If I can find... Did this go well? You see my screen? I will see a screen, but not in the presentation mode. There it is. Thank you. Okay. Oh, I hope. That's even the first slide. So I think I'm on the right track. Um, I can go on to this one. I'm going to speak about a man called Eilert Sundt. He is celebrated as the founding father of both ethnology and sociology in Norway. This is largely due to a series of investigations conducted during the mid-19th century. Sunt examined the living conditions and housing of the lower classes. He investigated their morals and customs, their work and their livelihood. His books were based on extensive fieldwork, uh, and his critical uh, investigations are very far from the romantic depictions which usually are associated with the discovery of a people in this period. Sund also made extensive use of statistics and quantitative approaches, which I suppose is one of the reasons why his work still seems very modern and convincing today. What has attracted less attention uh, in the research on, on, on and his reputation, his scientific or scholarly reputation, is that his books also are full of examples, and that Sunt explicitly discusses the uses of examples and their methodological value. In this paper, then, I will address his use of examples in one of his monographs called Sedle Stilstan in Norge, uh, on public morals in Norway, uh, would be so about an English title, published in 1857. This work investigates the large number of children that were born out of wedlock among the lower rural classes in Norway, and which were, by Sunt and others, regarded as proof of the low morals of their parents. And it follows from this then that the examples that uh, Sunt uh, was working with and that I'm going to present, they are not um, examples intended as models of conduct. They are not examples to follow. Instead, Sunt makes use of examples as instantiations in order to better explain and elucidate uh, the, the things that he are 
investigating. And explaining and elucidating has been a task of examples in classical rhetoric since antiquity. And equally old is the recognition that examples always are unruly. They always will contain surplus meaning, which tend to spill over. As Montaigne said, every example will limp a bit. But let's go on to Sunt. The first, um, first chapter in his book has a title, Some Examples, actually. And it starts with a series of small, well, narratives, small texts like this one. He says, the first person I met was a female who carried a child on her back and led another by the hand. With her other hand, she led a goat to a small patch of grass by the common road. She was married, uh, and her oldest child born before marriage, the second shortly after. No, she and her husband lived in the house of others and tried to leave and to earn a living as day laborers. Her suffering appearance convinced me of reports that many families of her class had suffered hunger during this spring. He presents a row of small stories of this kind, or small portraits of this kind, and then he asks, can one believe in the testimony of such examples? Will they not only be random sections, possibly biased and distorted bits or pieces of reality? Answering these rhetorical questions, Sunt says, Comparisons are essentials. And he also said, says they require counting and calculation. And then he goes on to present his calculations of the ratio between the number of marriages contracted and the number of unmarried couples with children in three parishes in the per period 1831 to 1850. And he concludes that for every 100 marriage, children were also born to 67 unmarried couples. As he then remarks, the last quote uh, on the slide here, if one could have gone from house to house in the same three parishes in the same years, it would have been possible to see and observe the same reality, but this reality can now effectively be presented by the figure 67. However, despite this very strong declaration in favor of numbers and calculations, this book is saturated with examples. And each chapter follows the same pattern. They start with a selection of stories before he proceeds to figures and tables. So one might wonder, or at least I have wondered, what do these examples do? Or rather, what makes Sunt, uh, what does Sunt make them do? Uh, to try to answer this, I will start with a discussion of how examples work and then go on trying to answer why Sunz makes use of them, what he needs them for, what kind of resources they present. So then, examples differ from linguistic tropes like metaphors and or synecdokes by explicitly announcing themselves. For instance, we tend to say, for example, we often say also. And this is exactly what Sunz does with the title of his chapter. Now, this feature gives example a special kind of exteriority, examples in text, that is. In text, examples are tropes that point beyond language. It points to reality itself. The example refers to something out there, apparently existing independent of the speaker or writer. And what Sunt presents in his examples are not general reflections on the mor morality among the rural poor, but descriptions of his own encounters with real people. This, the encounters that are presented in his text have taken place outside it, and that's just the point. And even more precisely, they have taken place in three specific areas of the upper part of the Gudbrandsdal Valley during spring and summer 1851. It's quite specific. But, and that's important, why the impression of this non-linguistic or extra-linguistic re uh, reality is very important to make examples work. It is also important to be there that it is, this impression is created by the means of specific discursive strategies. Literary scholar John D. Lyons has defined the example, I think I have a definition here, 
uh, as a quote, a dependent statement qualifying a more general and independent statement by naming a member of a class established by the general statement. An example cannot exist without a, a general statement, and b, an indication of its examples, that is, the example's subordinate status, according to lines. So by this logic, examples connect a specific, lo local and particular with more general principles or rules. This, is what, this connection is what makes a general and abstract more understandable and available directly. But equally important is it that the local and the particular in this way is imbibed with meaning beyond itself because it's presented as part of a more general class. Uh, and that's part of the dynamics of exemplarity or examples. This logic works both ways. Uh, the connection works both ways, but it is important to know that examples always be, will be examples of something. And in the case of Sun, he makes this very clear by the title of his book, On Public Morals. This is what his stories are examples of. So without, without, uh, within these frames, there can be little doubt about what his examples are meant to tell. As examples, they are by definition also instantiations of some general rule or maxim, and that makes them seemly clear and ambiguous and easy to understand. And it is just this connection between part and whole that both defines the example and makes it work. And the more self-evident and natural this connection appears, the more convincing the example will be. And for the same reason, example, examples need to appear as simply discovered out there, outside discourse, not as actively produced or arranged. But of course, that's not how it is. Examples are never just found. They are produced and constructed. Lyons points out that this exteriority that the example apparently represents actually presupposes an interiority or shared understanding among speaker and listener. If this understanding is out of order of some reason, outdated or not functional, the example will easily appear unclear, ambiguous, difficult to understand perhaps. It will still point beyond the text, but for someone who does not share the author's understanding, the connection between the example and the general rule will not be obvious, as is maybe the case with another example from Sund. Another story. He says, the next person that I met was a female who was weeding a potato field. She told me her story. Eight years ago, she had had to leave service because she was pregnant. For three years, she and the child had been homeless until she had made the child's father marry her. They still had no fixed abode, lived with others and owed nothing. They rented a potato field from a smallholder, but as they did not have any manure for it, it did not give much of a crop. Now, I think even for a modern reader, for people like us, this is a description of poverty and misery, which includes lack of work, lack of sufficient food and proper housing, as well as generally bad living conditions. But today we will perhaps not see this as a result of low morals, but rather understand it as caused by social and economic structures. Other related features of examples are undecidability and excess, still according to lines. Without an excess of meaning, the examples would be no more than the rule that it is intended to exemplify or illustrate. So to work properly, examples must bring something more with them. And because examples claim to have been found outside discourse, their excess, excess meaning needs to reflect some of the variation, diversity, and complexity of this exterior world. When Sult in some cases presents opinions and ideas that differ from his own, he increases the excess of meaning, and with it also the persuasive powers of his examples. According to Sult, it's very difficult to avoid saying, for example, even when giving a paper on examples. But however, here comes the next, next example. According to Sunt, the custom that young unmarried people of both sexes 
slept in the coal barns during the summer months was a cause of the bad morals that he was investigating. And he has be, uh, been discussing this with a young man, one of his informants. And he uh, presents the conversation as follows. Certainly, he said, the young man said, when he noticed my opinion, the farmers would do well to ban the custom, for they have no advantage from it, but rather damage. This is the young man. Soon to answers. Damage, we've heard, not, heard enough about that, but how can I speak about damage for the farmers in particular, I wondered. Well, for the clothing. For the clothing? Yes, the bell clothes. It gets so musty quickly in the barn because of the humidity from the cows. Oh, strange innocence. Who from his own miserable experience could have the mind to care for the paltry bell clothes of his master? As you can see, this excess of meaning also makes examples more ambivalent and undecidable. Uh, different understandings become possible, and some of them may even run counter to that of the author, as this text illustrates. But if the undecidability becomes too strong, the example will grow so unclear that it is turning into no more than an anecdote, an amusing story perhaps, but with no particular message. So there is a tension then between the exteriority and undecidability that examples need to work and the equally important between example and general rule which has, has to be there for, for the example to be understood. And this means that adding ambivalence, undecidability and excess of meaning also implies taking risk as a narrator. According to folklorist Elliot Oring, however, this risk is part of what he has called a rhetoric of truth. And Oring says, quote, the more risk a narrator takes in telling a tale, the more likely the story would be perceived as true, end quote. Oring's own example is a physician who tells a story about a patient whose daughter seemingly returned from the dead. In presenting this story as at least possibly true, the doctor set his own professional reputation at stake, and this was just what served to increase the credibility. Sunt, for his part, may have felt pretty safe that his readers would, would share his own understanding of the problem of, of the barn rather than that of the, the young man. But he nonetheless tells the story in a way that makes other ideas possible. And this plea then between the self-evidence and exteriority of examples on the one hand and their ambivalence, undecidability and excess on the other is an important and integral part of the use of examples and a prerequisite for the efficacy. Examples actually need to limp to work properly. But then, what does use, uh, Sunt use these examples for? What do they supply? that the numbers and tables could not do in his books. Sun seeks to convince his readers that his reports are trustworthy and his interpretations correct. The tables and the calculations, which are not uh, spoken much about, uh, they help him present his case or his logos, to use a rhetorical term. But he also needs, he needs something more. He needs a position to speak from. He must establish an ethos, and he must appeal to patrons. So even if his examples are not models of conduct, they still have important performative functions in his argument. The examples, I will argue, are vital elements in Sun's own rhetorical performance. The examples allow Sun to build an ethos based on a rhetoric of truth. According to Oring again, shortening the distance between the narrator and the narrated will increase credibility and is important to create such an ethos. To achieve this, the narrator may even choose to place himself within the narrative rather than outside it. And this is exactly what Sunt does. He enters his own stories by being a character in them. His examples all are centered on a distinct I, which is Sunt himself, who walks, looks and speaks to people. He is curious, he observes and asks questions. And he does not only refer the answers, he also presents his own questions, his reactions and his feelings. 
and they shortens the distance even more by reporting conversation as di direct speech. The informants appear as real living persons, and so does Sunt himself. So seen as performatives, the examples make it possible for Sunt to establish a strong ethos based on the closeness and identification with the narrated situations. At the same time, the examples contribute to pathos. In classical rhetoric, this concerns emotions, but Oring adds that in the rhetoric of truth, a moral aspect is also very important. A story will always appear more credible if it corresponds with the listener's ideology or pre-existing ideas. To convince, uh, stories should, uh, I quote Oring, present language, image such images and messages that stir pre-existing emotional dispositions. They are more apt to persuade if they can capitalize on resident fears and connect with deep-seated wishes." End quote. In Sud's case, the stories allow him to express his meanings in quite emotional terms, and his examples can be seen to address sentiment and values alike. He often gives vent to his own reactions to the people he meets and the information he receives often expressed in strong emotional terms. He says, for instance, to be upset by what he observed. He says that the peasant customs wounded him because they were ugly and barbaric. He's openly shocked by the number of unmarried parents and he's alarmed by the food in poor homes and he is bodily plagued by bug-infected bedsteads where he sleeps. And the effect of these emotional outbursts in the texts is increased when Sun says that he has always com also communicated the same feelings directly to his informants. And he also invites the reader very clearly to identify with the narrator with a narr narrated position and to share his feelings as well as his values. This makes it clear that the reactions are based on values that is, on moral norms. So even if it is, if it can be summarized in the number of 67, as in my initial example, uh, it is equally much about values and norms and feelings. It's a, simply the flagrant violation of norms among the poor peasant that causes disgust, in which he invites his readers to take part. The rhetoric of truth is not merely about a narrative thing in itself, but about engaging the readers ideologically and morally. So, to conclude, to end, the examples are as important as the statistics in Sun's work. They are important for performative reasons to enable Sun to establish his position as trustworthy, credible, and honest. They limp and they are unruly, and that is actually what they have to do because they are of vital importance both as rhetorical devices and as scholarly tools in Sun's works. And I also think that examples have about the same position in our own works when we quote our empirical cases. Uh, but not, that's not part of my paper, so that is the thing we might discuss now. Thank you. And thank you so much, Sonia, for the great paper. And I, my question was your last statement. Mm. <laughs> um, because we, we touched a little bit upon this yesterday when we talked about um, uh, the relationship between evidence and an example. And I had this chat with Antti yesterday, and Antti in this chat talked about how we use, use examples today in the qualitative research. Um, do anybody have questions for Anna? Sorry, I didn't see you, Tina. Tina, Tina. Sorry, I, I used my, my own hand instead of the raised hand. It, it is quite okay. Thank you, Anna, very much for a very fascinating paper, very rich, and, and uh, you want to sort of digest it before uh, putting questions. But but still, I, I would like you to, to maybe elaborate a bit on the last part about the disgust also that uh, Ayla Sund is uh, evoking uh, through his text. Does the, the disgust some, sometimes sort of uh, uh, 
uh, escapes him, uh, escape him in, in the sense that it works the other way around. Instead of creating uh, trust and uh, honesty, then creating uh, more ambivalence or uh, more undecidability. I don't know whether that's a term, but you, you, you get the point. Uh, uh, or Yes, thank you. Yeah, yeah thank you. Um, that's, a, that's a good and very relevant question. Um, to start uh, a bit beside, perhaps, I've been wondering myself, uh, about this very this emotional outbursts uh, about how uh, they seem quite sudden and impulsive in some cases. I've been wondering if they are that or whether they are part more part of a strategy, and I don't know that. Uh, but what I do know, and uh, which is perhaps more relevant to your question, is that the books uh, provoke quite strong reactions, uh, partly from people who were shared his, uh, his, re his own reactions and thought that, oh, this is terrible, that we can't have all these illegitimate children around and, and we have to improve the morals of the, of the peasants and so on. Uh, but it also pro uh, provoked reaction from people wanting to defend the peasants and, and saying it's not that bad. Uh, and we know that the peasants are the core of the nation and they are kind of noble savage in the great national panorama and, and so on. And I'm, so, so this uh, caused quite a debate in the newspapers and journals and so on. And uh, I, I, don't, I haven't checked this, but it is said that the, in its time, very, very famous uh, stories by our national, nationalistic, also Björn Stern and Björnsson, he wrote a series of very idyllic uh, narratives about peasants. Björnsson's Bonne for telling it in Norwegian, that they were written in direct answer to Sund's supporters of the rural population. Uh, and they are really, really idols, really stories about no, noble peasants in uh, among their green fields uh, and in their peasant costumes and everything is very beautiful. And today they seem, uh, Björnsson's uh, stories seem pretty silly. Uh, and are completely outdated, but they are, they are said to have been written as a direct reaction to this far more uh, both negative and emotional, negatively emotional uh, uh, portraits made, made by some. So it definitely caused reactions. Um, but as, as, as I started to say, I've been wondering how much of this was genuine emotion from some that it just couldn't contain and what is part of a more of a rhetorical strategy, and I don't know that actually. Barbara? Um, thank you. Um, I have just a minor question, and I guess it is stupid. Um, I've been asked to comment upon the whole collection, so so I've been trying to 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 see you um, all on the same plate, and um, and when I do so, I um, uh, I get the impression that your paper is uh, the most different one uh, in the bunch of five, and I would like to ask you: Would you say that the examples in the texts are? And the exemplary that they are actually an inverted uh, forebuilder, or, or is that too simple? Is there anything here that I can't grasp? Mm. Well, they are definitely not ideals or models. They could, of course, be. I mean, examples taken as ideals or models or forebuilds. Um, can of course be both positive and negative. I mean, they can say both do it, do things like that. And they also can say don't do things like that. Uh, and of course, uh, one might uh, place uh, Sunt and his examples in the, in the last uh, category. Don't do things like this. Uh, but the problem then is that if you say a thing like that, you have to say it to people who are likely to to do it to need this lesson. And what complicates matters here, of course, is that Sunt is writing about, he's taking 
his examples from the rural population, but he is not being read by them. He's being read by some kind of urban middle classes, intellectuals and so on, who would never behave in this way in, in any case. Uh, so this model function is not the most important in this case, uh, not even as negative examples. So I do think that uh, Sundt is more over in the quantitative or serial way of understanding examples even here, uh, which is one of the ways that examples have always been, always been used. Uh, but then on the other hand, this limping nature of example, which in, in my, that's very important, Part of my thinking about examples is that examples have to link. They have to be both uh, models, ideals, or types, uh, perhaps. That's perhaps a better word in this case. And they have to refer to some kind of a series. They have to be uh, not only unique cases, because they, they will be just themselves. They have to be part of something larger. And this larger matter is... Partly the general statement, but it's partly also a kind of series, one of many. Uh, and as I said, examples have to have both these aspects, but as Sunt, after all, is using his examples uh, in a very serial way. Uh, I think that is the most important part of it for him. And he uses it in a serious way, of course, because the, the major argument in his book is this uh, statistic uh, thing that I mentioned uh, at the start. This is, the, this is framing the whole thing. But also, he hardly ever gives just one example. I picked out some of his examples now because I had, didn't have that much time to, to use for my paper. Uh, but he's nearly always enumerating, what I don't know, I thought of 10 examples after each other before going on with, um, with the argument or with the st statistics. So he's very much on the serial side of, um, of example uh, rationality. But still, examples are never only serious, never only one case among many, because if they were, they were, wouldn't be needed. Uh, you could uh, satisfy yourself by, by the number 67. Uh, by counting, so there have to be something more uh, about them as well. And I, I think this, this um, ambivalence and two-sidedness of examples, I think it's quite fascinating. And I think it's, um, it's interesting not just to generalize about that, but to see how these dimensions, how this tension is at play, is at stake uh, in different uh, cases, in different kind of texts or performative or, or whatever. Um, I think, for instance, when we as uh, ethnologists, folklorists, anthropologists um, use examples from our field work or from our texts in our articles and, uh, and books, how do we do that? Do we cite one example? And if so, how do we select just that example from everything we have? Folklorists tend to, to choose the best stories. I don't quite know, know what ethnologists do, uh, even as anthropologists perhaps, but, but how do we do it? I think we should perhaps, uh, I think we could use example theory to, to think about to be more as well. No. It was a very long answer and a rambling one, but anyhow. It was a good one. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, and uh, we have a last question from Julian before we move on to the discussion. Um, yes. So it's 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 a more more a uh, more a very a general question. I mean, the way we give examples in anthropology, the way we we provide examples. I mean, it, it has drastically changed over the, the, the last decades. I mean, um, ethnography at the beginning of the last century and then Malinowski's diary, we talk more and more about our emotions in, in, in the field, which was a taboo 100 years ago. So how has, or what do we make of that? Or what do you make of this? change in the way we give examples i mean the norms how to give examples and what example is what what makes an example a good example so if i would um if i would just write an ethnography using the realist tale 
the the preppers do this, the preppers do that. A general, a, a typical day in the life of a prepper looks like that. So to give really this generalizing account, it it would be regarded as a rather flawed ethnography, a flawed ethnographic text. So we wouldn't accept this kind of giving example and giving evidence anymore. So how do you do you or the other think about that? the kind of change, the, the way we give examples in, in, in our articles, in our ethnographies, in our books. Because I, I think what, what you presented, Anna, gives, uh, um, offers, offers an opportunity or a way to, to think about that uh, change, <laughs> that historical change. Yeah, I think that's a very, very good point uh, and an important one. Um, when I started working with Sunt, uh, I knew him as the man who introduced the statistics and quantitative approaches in uh, folk life studies. In, and that's why he's also reckoned uh, as the founding father of sociology, I suppose. Uh, and then I started reading, and I was surprised by the enormous number of examples in, him, it's in, in his texts. I'm fascinated by it. So, so I was thinking, what's he doing? What's the relation between uh, quantitative uh, information and examples in, in his texts? Uh, and then when I listened to Antti yesterday with this uh, evidence-based exemplarity and uh, um, the modern science um, and so the scientific facts that circulate uh, today, uh, I was thinking along the lines that you suggested uh, now, Julian, that things have changed quite a lot uh, in this period from soon to the present, uh, because we are all getting so used to relating to statistics, to uh, scientific facts, which are, which are ne nearly always based on some kind of quantitative num numeric data. Uh, while Sunt, he was uh, educated uh, in theology, he was supposed to be a clergyman, uh, I suppose he was even. Uh, he came from a tradition of classical rhetoric and moral examples in preaching uh, and so on. And even if uh, statistics was starting to be used in different kind of uh, sciences and also even social sciences uh, in the mid uh, 19th century, it was very, very far from as self-evident and self-explaining as it is today. So his statistics had to or needed to be accompanied by examples in quite another way than uh, statistics have to be today, to, to be, be un understood and to seem convincing. Um, so it's quite a different historical situation, simply. Uh, when we read books today, if, if we had read Sun's books today without his statistics, it would have seemed completely out of date. Uh, it is his use of statistics that makes him seem so modern. Still today, even if his moral judgments and values and the norms are completely outdated, he still seems modern because he used to use the statistics. Uh, and today we have the situation with so-called statistic facts just circulating, uh, circulating like, uh, well, commodities, even commercial commodities all the time. And as readers, we have still, we have another kind of competence in relating to facts, to, to statistics, to tables, to graphs of all kinds. But nonetheless, we still use examples. And I think we need them to, to get this uh, particular information, this specific, the local, the concrete, and to get the emotional or affective dimension into it, because statistics, after all, is quite bad at communicating uh, emotions. You can measure emotions, I suppose, and make a graph of that, but, but I mean, to get an emotional response, you still need something else than just a beautiful table, even if it's in colors. So, yes, but I think there's a, definitely a historical development in the use of examples, also in, in scholarly work. And I think we should investigate that more, just not just take them for granted or overlook them, because we so often do. 
Thank you, Anna. Uh, we're moving into a general discussion now, and uh, I think it's time for our discussions. And we have invited one of, I must say, one of my favorite scholars to be a discussant, Barbara Blair. Uh, she's a professor of ethnology at Stockholm University, and she actually was my opponent when I defended my PhD 14 years ago. And that was a great um, discussion we had that then. So I, I, I'm looking forward to this. Go ahead, Badru. Um, thank you very much, Kirin. And thank you for the invitation to comment. It's, um, it's great fun. It's a great honor. It's uh, a little difficult. And um, my notes are a mess, so uh, I just uh, dive, well, throw myself out in it. Um, first, um, two small notes about the background. Uh, when I um, happily accepted <laughs> this task, um, it had to do with the fact that I understood exemplarity as something related to stating something in earnest. And uh, this is, um, I think, a personal hunch. I'm very much thrilled when people do something that is supposed to be taken seriously. We, we are all different, but uh, I, um, some people like uh, carnivals and I like, uh, I like serious rituals, uh, or both. Um, and this, of course, does not mean that people always take, uh, always um, produce the right uptake. Uh, things that are meant to be taken in earnest can can flop. They can be ridiculed. They can be everything, and and that's something that we have to just investigate. And um, that was the well, <laughs> widest background. Next is that we regrettably um, didn't have Dorothy Noyes here just today, but uh, in a way, her spirit will be with us because I read in advance her paper from uh, 2016, just, just towards utopia, towards a theory of exemplarity. And I was greatly um, it inspired me a lot. So my, um, for those of you who are familiar with it, I guess her thoughts will echo in what I, something of what I say. And having said that, I, I tried to, to pin down uh, comments or reflections under three headings. And they are, the first one is um, uh, performance versus rhetoric or performance versus narrative. And the second is the competence of interpretation and the power to contest or resist. And the third deals with what uh, Dorothy Noyes sketched out as um, residual, dominant, and emergent exemplarity. Three, well, three kinds, three types. And then I have to admit that during the discussion, I also, I also jotted down some sundry reflections, and we will see if I can if I can integrate them too. But the, uh, first, the performed and the narrative, the performed and the rhetoric. Uh, in a way, I get the feeling that uh, some of the papers dealt with exemplarity that was performed bodily, and while others leaned more to exemplarity as narrated, like, for example, Kira's paper yesterday, or with some hesitation on this today. Um, and in a way, that is a property of the of the, um, the example, the, the thing studied. But on the other hand, of course, it's just a matter of analytical approach. Because I think all of the five cases could be studied with um, an overweight 
on what is performed or an overweight on how the thing that is exemplary is put together by aid of verbal reasoning. And I would like to, if, if, if I may, I would like to exemplify that with um, some thoughts on Kira's paper on Greta Thunberg, because I think that your, your analysis was very much focused on how, how she draws on uh, the serial concept of the child in her efforts to persuade the adult word to, <laughs> to panic in order to act. And what struck me was that if we sort of switched analytical um, focus and tried to figure Greta Thunberg, not as a person, not as a real Greta Thunberg, but as the sort of the persona she creates and well, puts at the center of our attention. Um, as you said in your paper, she is, looks very much like a child. But I think that that statement resonates with me even more when I figure her size and her clothes and her braids and her appearance and her face. So I wondered, um, I just wondered if you if you had the opportunity to add three pages to your paper, what it would be like if you if you sort of blocked out her words and focused on how she moves on the scene um, with, well, bodily stance and gestures and so on. Um, and reflecting upon the combination of performance, bodily performance and words, of course, uh, it was uh, extremely inviting to <laughs> reflect on Wim Hof. And the ice swimmer who who um, stands out as a sort of epitome of somebody that performs things with his body. Um, we saw some rather heavy pictures yesterday. And in that case, um, the interplay between action and and stance and um, and prestation. Uh, and on the one hand, and scientific evidence of the very hard kind is truly thrilling, of course. Um, <laughs> my, and what, what, may, what, what I uh, sort of wondered uh, in that connection was the idea that uh, many of you have mentioned that in order to function, to work as an, as an example, uh, what is put forth has to be sort of identifiable or recognizable. And then I thought it was great fun <laughs> that when you said that uh, normally people who swim in winter in Finland used to be elder women, so he is sort of atypical. Uh, he breaks loose from, in a way, he breaks loose from a serial um, dimension in order to be very, very unique. And then I thought yesterday about, we have lost Ina Luis. Have we? She had such a lot of. Um work with students' uh, assignments. So I see. I see. Fin finish before her engagement with the Institute runs out. So she had to cancel today. I see, I see, I see. Uh, uh, let me say something brief, um, uh, nevertheless, because what we saw on her tableaus, on the paintings yesterday, were <laughs> thrilling to think of in this regard, because um, the picture uh, that she dwelt uh, on well for the most time 
depicted uh, some four or five persons sitting around a table and one standing behind the table looking at us. And these are not real people. These are sort of <laughs> idealized representations of roles in a particular setting in the Danish history. And if it hadn't been <laughs> for Ina Louise's competence, I would have grasped zero, uh, of course, like perhaps, well, it's not just me. Um, so in, in that case, we were extremely dependent upon a clever translator who could uh, describe to us what, what is really on the picture and how are we supposed to understand it. And what I picked up in particular, too, from Ina um talk was uh, the concept of density, uh, densification. And um, um, I would have liked to ask her, so I ask you instead, how is the density produced? I think it's produced by focusing and highlighting detail. It's produced by blocking out or marginalizing other things. And I think it will be extremely interesting to reflect upon how density on one hand works together with, with what un, uh, cause unruliness. Could we say that densification is working as a barrier to prevent unruliness? And can densification be more or less successful? Of course it can, but there's, there's something to, to remember, something to pick up here and return to, I, I hope. Um, and when it comes to the, to the two papers today, um, I make the I get the, the the feeling that those preppers and utopians who go to the camps and who act things in order to learn in order to learn to the future learn for the future on the one hand they are all on the <laughs> on the pole of the bodily engagement. They are acting, they are acting, they are learning, they are tasting, they are exploring. They are not seemingly the Seemingly, they are not into rhetoric at all. And at the same time, of course, they are... All their activities take place in a universe that is also verbalized for us. So we are sort of... If we know the right context, we can understand them correctly. Um, and I will return to Anna and the examples <laughs> afterwards in Edison's book. So, uh, to sum up the first point, um, all your examples uh, are sort of nourished in the interplay between bodily performances and words. And it's up to you as scholars to decide how should you sort of, what kind of analysis do you want to prioritize? Will you go deeper into the rhetoric part of it, the narr narrative side of it, or focus on the well, the gestures and the bodies and the the um, acting out? Well, so far, uh, so far for that. My second point: the interpretation and the power to contest. Um, I was very. Um, sort of intrigued, those of you who were present yesterday uh, will remember that I posed a very, um, oh, I'm lost for words, impertinent question or, or a question that was impossible to answer to Ina Luisa. When did people cease to understand that picture? Of course, that's an impossible question to ask. But... Um, it set me on the track because um, I can't read my note. Sorry. Um, I'm thinking that, of course, in principle, there's always a potential for misunderstanding. 
simply because we do not know, simply because we, I think at the Turnbase case, simply because we don't have any connotations, we don't have a strong connotation to, as to what is a child, so we miss the point when she, perhaps that is a little, little thought, for example, because we all know what the child is. But uh, imagine if we didn't know what a child was, her, well, the um, potential, the strength uh, in, in her appearance wouldn't speak to us. Um, it's much more easy, I think, to imagine what it would be like to don't understand the preppers or the utopians because we are not into the universe where they, their actions are meaningful. And that brings me to something that might uh, overlap my third point to a certain extent. Uh, Dorothy Noyes in her 2016 paper uh, also reflected upon the huge differences in um, the preconditions for setting an example in modern time uh, or whatever we shall term our times, late modern or digital or uh, viral. Um, she mentioned... Um, for example, uh, uh, Rosa Parks sitting on the bus and uh, refusing to stand up, sitting on the bus on a seat for whites, uh, looking out the window, being extremely composed and, and uh, self-dignified. And she made a remark that this example was set in, in a time, in a, in a society where the person acting it out was granted attention in, in the press, but in a in a, compared to today, in a rather limited uh, public uh, sphere, where there were not a deluge of messages and impulses showing, you know, drowning all of us. As compared to um, Keita Thunberg's uh, iconic body, is looking at us from so many platforms. She's sort of part of an ever, never ceasing flow of impulses and and um, and um, yeah, and, and pictures, not least pictures. And somehow, it's, it's impossible not to start thinking that in a society that is slower and provides us with fewer impressions than the society we live in, in today, the competence issue must have been easier in a way. Because today there's so much going on out there that it is impossible for us to catch up with and uh, get under our skin. And does this then mean that the potential for resisting and contesting and not being moved in the right direction that this potential also is augmenting for every day? Is it easier for people today to be mad about Geta Thunberg or the preppers or the utopians than it was for uh, the people in the well, 70s, 80s that were witnesses to, um, to the tableau? In, in, in Aloysius' paper? Or if we start believing that, are we doing injustice to our predecessors? Are we simply making history tidier or, or um, more straightforward than it actually was? I don't know. Of course, I don't know. But I think it's a bit intriguing to, to reflect upon to what extent our 
our analytical approaches are specific to um, a particular um, a particular spell of, of, of time or, or a particular type of society. In what because much of what we want to do is to to take a bird's perspective and compare things that are actually as different as the uh, tableaus from the Danish court and Wim Hof on the same plate. And so, well, <laughs> I leave it there. Uh, my third point about the residual, dominant, and emergent exemplarity, uh, which I now perhaps uh, simplify uh, over you, uh, uh, Aunt Julian. Uh, I understood uh, Naya's um, argument there in terms of the residual exemplarity sort of being supportive of an order that is already there. Uh, well, the emergent pointed into the future, into utopias, very easy to, to identify it with the preppers. Um, and the dominant, uh, she related to everyday conduct. And she, uh, here's where the overlap is. Um, she sketched out how there is a slow exemplarity working by being sort of repeated day after day after day after day. What came to my mind actually was, um, it's a queer example perhaps, <laughs> being exposed to the same Christian universe Sunday after Sunday after Sunday, year after year after year after year. Something is changing and something is, is perfectly the same. There is, I, I get this from partly from literature because um, um, this is a way of growing into a universe, and, and the scholars of religion have claimed that uh, it's increasingly um, it's more and more seldom that people actually get to know that religious universe by listening to it every Sunday. But that that was an aside. But it is good. It is good uh, illustration of how it is to be repeatedly exposed to the same ideas, um, while the um, Emergent exemplarity was tied by Norris to more like meeting things on the internet every day. And she remarked that um, the emergent exemplarity seemed to be connected to more and more violent uh, expressions. And again, it's, it's very easy to, to uh, associate the emergent exemplarity with well, a proliferation of possible understandings and, and uh, projects and um, agendas. And with much more um, conflicts than procedural exemplarity or everyday exemplarity. And again, I might be perfectly wrong so if i am perfectly wrong please help me <laughs> help me to get out of that uh, uh, that uh, thought trap um let me uh, let me close with two of the well the sundry <laughs> sundry notes i i also want to remind us that auntie yesterday uh, raised the question of the concept of typification in this context. And I don't have anything intelligent to add, but I applaud the initiative because I think it's so enormously rewarding when we try to translate between different traditions of thought. So if possible, let's get back to that idea and ask Antti if you can expand it. And my very last, uh, last uh, note was, um, um, the discussion between Anna and Julian a second ago, um, how do we use examples um, in our own uh, scholarly um, activities? One thing I think is that we have, in the course of the last 30 years, I think we have moved away from an ideal of using examples um, to prove seriality 
This is typical for that. And we have moved into a modus where we rather focus on, I think this is an impulse from Anne Eriksson's and Ellen Krefting's um, book in Norwegian, uh, Exemplus Makt, um, where you speak, I think that is where you speak about the, the causes in Latin, uh, the case, the case that is not typical, it's not part of a serial, um, not necessarily, but it, it serves in our texts as a box that we open in order to unpack complexity. And um, I, at least I, I'm sure that when I uh, supervise people, I sort of try to push them into using their examples as cases and not as serious. And I think that's, um, well, I think it's, it's a move in the right direction. Thank you. Thank you so much, Barbara, for a very, very rich comment. Um, we have actually six minutes left. Uh, do anybody uh, want to comment upon Barbara's comment? Julian, Ina, Antti, Anna, or anybody else? Anna? Just wanted to say thank you, Bando. You make us all seem very intelligent with this comment. That's a great help. <laughs> thank you. I agree. I agree with that. Thank you very much for your comments. For me, it's uh, one of the interesting things about e e using exemplars and speaking of this rhetorical mode of exemplarity is that it seems to me that it's often quite an implicit way of presenting things. So that, of course, many times we frame something explicitly as an example, as Anne said, but often we just uh, like throw out examples as, as if they explain themselves. And uh, we usually leave things unsaid uh, and leave for the audience to infer what is being presented as, as an example of something more general. And, it, <clears throat> and I think it's, it's in this pointing to where we can find this often implicit pointing to something more general that where we can find mo most interesting negotiations and contestations. And uh, yeah, I think, I think this sort of rhetorical mode, there's a, <clears throat> there must be a word for it. I think in classical rhetoric, it's something, something called entomematic Arist Aristotle or something. Someone used it like leaving premises unsaid so that the audience has to infer it. It's a common technique in like humor, humor and such modes of communication. I think often exemplars using like using e e exemplarity as a rhetoric mode, it's often something something similar. But thank you. Oh, I just have to say you are intelligent, all of you. So, so take it to heart. Um, thank you, Antti, for uh, reminding me of um, of the, the the unsaid in the examples. I don't know if you if you recognize this, but sometimes when I'm at work and I'm in a discussion with somebody, and I want to make a point clear, uh, I think, oh, perhaps I should try to figure an example. And every time I say, no, I won't, because that will be dangerous, because it will always backfire. It will always be wrong. It will always be, be at risk for conveying something that I don't want to convey, which ties neatly, I think, into Anna's concept of uh, unruliness. They are so powerful, but they cannot be controlled. I think we just have to conclude that there's several things in, in, in your comment that we need to to discuss further. For instance, the relationship between between type and examples, and between the case and and example. And I really hope that we will be able to, to meet in person when this whole COVID nineteen situation is 
calming down uh, uh, to discuss examples further. So thank you so much for uh, attending this session and thank you so much for your presentations and thank you so much for your comment, Barbara. And have a nice midsummer, everybody. Thank you for your sympathetic presentation. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Be seeing you. Good seeing I, you. I agree with you. We should meet somewhere at some point.